Hi everyone, welcome back to this channel. In this video, I'm going to talk about how to write chapter one of a PhD thesis proposal. The question I wanted to ask is what role does chapter one play? And the answer is that chapter one acts like an appetizer. It is supposed to whet your reader's appetite or not. Depending on how you write it, it's going to achieve that particular purpose. It also sets the pace and the tone for your readers. Do they want to continue reading it? And are they going to be interested in reading the rest of your proposal? So keep this in mind, keep these two points in mind when you're writing out your chapter one. So what does chapter one entail? Chapter one has a number of sections, which I'm going to cover section by section. And the first section is the introduction to the chapter. This is normally a very short paragraph and it's, it's supposed to inform the reader on what the chapter is going to cover. So it's the first section of chapter one. The introduction to the chapter is then followed by background to the study. And in this section, the student is supposed to provide a historical explanation of the topic and the investigation. It's supposed to use data and statistics to show how the topic or the issue being investigated has evolved over time and how big is the magnitude of that particular issue. The background to the study also provides the context of the study. So normally when you're writing the background to the study, you start from a global context and you move down to a specific context. So for instance, if your topic is about a specific country A and you're addressing a particular issue. So for instance, um, as, as an example, maybe you're addressing COVID-19 in country A. So you start at the global level, the infection rates, death rates from COVID-19, then you move to regionally. So for instance, if country A is based in Africa, you talk about COVID-19 in Africa, and then you narrow down your context to country A. Once you have detailed the background of the study, the next section is the statement of the problem, or, rather, or alternatively, the problem statement. And this is normally the elephant in chapter one. I'm saying this because most students really struggle with stating the problem of their study. And the statement of the problem is one of the most common questions that I've seen being asked during uh, defense of PhD thesis proposals. So you'll hear comments such as, I don't see any problem here, or your problem is not a problem, or your problem is not clear at all. You need to go back and redefine your problem statement. So to, to clarify, your statement of the problem, you need to start by stating what the problem is first. That should be the first sentence. After stating what the problem is, then go ahead and explain why that particular problem is actually a problem. And the other thing to keep in mind is that the problem that you've stated will influence your research objectives or questions, and it will also influence your research methodology. After stating your problem, then the next thing you need to do is to justify, to provide a justification of the study. And justification of the study is also referred to as the rationale for the study. It addresses the need for the study. Why, uh, why do you need to conduct the study? Why should the study be conducted? And why does the problem warrant investigation? You have to provide a very clear justification for conducting the study. After justification of the study, the next section is the significance of the study. And this differs from justification in the sense that significance of the study speaks to the, the benefits that would accrue from conducting the study. And this can have different perspectives. You can, you can, you can look at it from the academic point of view. That is, what is your contribution to the body of knowledge? And contribution can be through maybe an extension of a theory, Maybe you want to use a new methodology, probably want to, need to use new data that has just been published to see how the status of the problem is currently. And maybe you also want to study that particular topic in, an, in a neglected population. So for instance, maybe it has been studied in different populations, but a specific population has been neglected. So 
if you study that neglected population then it it brings about you you it brings about some contribution to body of knowledge and i must say that contribution to body of knowledge is really key for any phd thesis this is one of the things that your your supervisors and those um, examining and reviewing your thesis or even your proposal are going to look at is this thesis contributing to any any knowledge does it have any intellectual contribution so while you're writing out your proposal always keep that in mind then the second perspective that you can use when you're writing out the significance of the study is the practical perspective and this includes the benefits to the various stakeholders that in one way or another are affected or are involved in the topic under investigation and this can be the government can be practitioners in that particular field it can be communities it can also be individuals specific individuals who would benefit when you conduct that study after significance of the study the next section is the objectives of the study stroke research questions so these two objectives of the study and research questions are sort of like two sides of a coin because the research questions are are objectives in question form so different programs have different requirements some will require you to to either have one either the objectives or the research questions while others will have you will require you to have both in your proposal so there are two types of objectives we have the general objective and this reflects the topic of the study from the general objective you then state the specific objectives and this break down the general objective into a number of specific objectives so the objectives should emanate from your research problem so you should ask yourself after i have achieved my objectives will the problem have been addressed and then when stating the the specific objectives you should use action verbs and the action verbs will imply the research methodology that you're going to use as an example um, if i use to explore then that implies that i'm going to use a qualitative research approach and if i use something like to analyze that will imply that i'm going to use a quantitative research approach you should also vary your action verbs don't be those students who use just one verb to state their specific objective so for instance if you have four objectives don't just use to i would to analyze to analyze to analyze to analyze vary those action verbs this will show that you have read widely and that you know exactly what you you're doing and something that i have found to be useful when i want to vary my action verbs or i want to when i want to specify my research objectives is to get insights from published journal papers so what you can do is you can create an excel sheet or an excel file with about three columns and the first column is every time you read a journal article note down the 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 objective of that study the objectives of the, of that study in one column and then the next column you specify the action verb that was used and then in the third column you can specify the research methodology that was used along with that specific objective so this really helps you to come up with a list of many action verbs that you can use for your own study and also to understand how that action verb will imply which research methodology approach that you're supposed to use so besides the objectives of the study and or research questions the next thing that I should go into chapter 1 is the scope of the study and the scope of the study basically um, in, entails the boundaries within which your study will be conducted it implies the breadth and depth of your study how deep you're going to go how wide you are going to go and while specifying the scope of your study you should consider 
several constraints such as time and budget. Remember that your PhD program is time limited. You only have maybe three or five at most years to complete your program. So your scope should be PhD worthy, not too narrow and also not too, too, not too broad, not too wide that you'll be unable to complete it. And while specifying your scope, you should also justify why you have selected that scope, that particular scope. The next section is the limitations, stroke delimitations of the study. There's a difference between these two and limitations are outside the control of a student and they're caused by circumstances. So an example is political unrest in a study site. So for instance, if you're conducting your study in a country that is about to have a general election and you know that country has a history of political unrest, especially during the time of general elections. And it happens that during the time that you want to collect your data is also the time that the general elections are happening. And political unrest happens in a region that you really wanted to collect your data from. from. So that is a limitation because it is outside your own control. Another example is COVID-19 restrictions. When COVID-19 happened, there it came with so many restrictions, including social distancing, lockdowns, um, travel bans. So if you were to conduct, if you were conducting your study, your research during that particular time, then you are restricted in terms of data collection, especially if you are planning to use the, uh, methods like one-to-one -one interviews and, um, and surveys administered by research assistants. So the, those restrictions were outside the student's control. So um, in as much as there are limitations to a study, there should be, they should be mitigated. So the student should come up with ways, strategies on how he or she can mitigate those limitations. So for instance, um, in the case of political unrest in a study site, the student can choose to replace that region with another region. And with, in regard to COVID-19 restrictions, the student can decide to use more innovative ways of data collection, such as, for instance, uh, data collection through phone interviews or mail, or he or she can mail questionnaires to the respondents. Of course, these have their own pros and cons that the student should be aware of. So those are uh, examples of how to mitigate um, such unexpected or unexpected limitations. The limitations, on the other hand, are within the student's control. They are usually a matter of choice. And whereas limitations should be mitigated, the limitations should be justified. And the limitations are closely related to the scope of the study. And examples include the choice of the unit of analysis. So why choose one unit of analysis and not the other? Why choose one research methodology? So for instance, qualitative research approach and, and not quantitative research approach. So these are matter of a student's choice and the student should be able to justify his choices. The other thing is the definition of key terms. This should also come in chapter one. And definition of key terms used in the study helps readers to understand the concepts of your study. Um, don't assume that everyone reading your paper or reading your proposal is an expert in that topic or is an expert in that field. No, not everyone will be an expert. Not all your readers will be an expert in you in your field of study. So you need to define the key terms that you use in your proposal or your thesis. And rather than use connotative or the dictionary definitions, you need to use the denotive definitions. And the definitions you should be specific to your studies context. So what I mean here is that some key terms will have more than one definitions. As an example, if my study is on M health, which is my topic of investigation for my PhD, M health has been defined by the World Health Organization in a particular way. And then you also have other organizations defining it 
in a in, in, in a different way. And then you also have researchers who have done their, their who've conducted their studies in M health, they also come up with their own definitions. So when I read all these definitions, I should specify which of the definitions which of the definitions that are out there is applicable to my study and to my and to the context of my study. So I should not just use the definitions blindly. I should be very specific on which definition I'm using and how it is applicable and why it is applicable to my study. And then last but not least is the chapter summary. This is the last section of chapter one and like the introduction section, it is also a very short paragraph and it also summarizes the key points that were covered in the chapter. So in conclusion, I wanted to also point out a few things. Um, I wanted to say that the format of a PhD thesis proposal will vary from one institution to another. This applies also to the various chapters of your proposal. So chapter one, the structure of chapter one may vary from one institution to another. So PhD students should always make use of the institution's guide. And when you're writing out your proposal, you should use future tense. So for instance, this study will investigate, this study will look at, this study will examine. And then to also help you with the writing process, you need to read as many PhD theses as you can. Um, most universities provide open access to their PhD dissertations or theses, so you can always just Google program that is that is related to what you're covering and then look for the PhD theses and dissertations that have been done by pre previous PhD students. Just look at how they write out their, their thesis, look at how they structure their chapters, look at how they state their problems, look at how they state their, how they formulate their objectives and so on and so forth. So, so this will give you, give you an idea of how the proposal, the PhD thesis proposal should be written. And then lastly is that there should be consistency throughout your proposal. So what you write in chapter one should spill over to what you'll write in chapter two and, the, and also what you're going to write in chapter three. So there should be that thread running through your proposal from the start to the end of your proposal. So I hope this video has been helpful to you. I hope you learn one or two things that will help you to write your chapter one of your PhD thesis proposal. Thank you for watching. Um, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.